I'm here with Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Alexander, let's talk about Russia, Ukraine, the EU, energy, gas, transit, um, all the things that really matter when discussing geopolitics, because what's going on in what is wrapped up, actually, is probably better better way to put it. What is wrapped up in Congress with the Ukraine impeachment hoax and all this stuff is a complete sideshow. This is real geopolitics, real yes. power politics, what's going on right now. So explain to us a story that has been underreported. And you did mention it during our live stream. Earlier, earlier, well, earlier, earlier today. today. Yes. So get yeah. into it in a little more detail now. I mean, th this is actually the, this is actually the key because it's it's it goes to a great to the heart of why there's a Ukrainian crisis at all. Now, the, the thing to understand, first of all, is that for the foreseeable future, Russia is going to remain Europe's biggest supplier of natural gas. And over time, um, the share of natural gas in the European energy mix is likely to grow. It's, this is, these are two long-term trends. There's been various attempts at various times to reverse them, but it's very difficult to see how that's going to change. Now, the, the gas industry in Russia was originally developed in Soviet times at a time when both Ukraine and Russia were part of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union built the original pipelines from the USSR, as it then was, to Europe to, trans to transport the gas. And he built them through Ukraine. So the major pipeline, the biggest pipeline complex, there is one called the Druzhba, means friendship pipeline, which is which passes through Ukraine, goes to Europe, and it supplies natural gas to Europe. And until 2006, that was overwhelmingly the most important route. There was a, a, another much smaller pipeline that passed through uh, Belarus, but the big one was Ukraine. And what happened then, of course, was that the USSR broke up. Ukraine became an independent country, but the gas from Russia then had to part, continue to pass through Ukraine, which became both a gas importer from Russia for its own needs and a transit state, a country through which Russian gas was passing to reach other European customers. And the Ukrainians charged the Russians a substantial amount of money, around $3 billion a year, for the right to pass their gas through Ukraine. Now, this for the Ukrainians was a good arrangement. And in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, it was an even better arrangement because the Russians in those days said to themselves, well, we need to keep Ukraine friendly. So how are we going to keep them friendly? We're going to provide them with gas at a very much lower price than the market price. Now, that meant what, what the Ukrainians used to do was that the pipe, the gas used to go to Ukraine, would be imported by Ukraine at a very low price. And then the Ukrainians would then re-export it to Europe at a much higher price making actually a killing from it. And all sorts of people in Ukraine became very rich on the back of it. One particularly notorious person who used to play this game uh, is Yulia Timoshenko, the so-called gas princess, who is one of the most important oligarchs in Ukraine. And she is, of course, also uh, a major political player in Ukraine. In Ukraine, politics and business oligarchs, if you like. I mean, they're conflated. They're one and the same. Anyway, along comes Vladimir Putin. He doesn't like this arrangement at all. He doesn't see why the Ukrainians should have cheap gas. He starts telling the Ukrainians, you've got to start paying the market price for gas. And so what first happens is in 2006, there's a big quarrel between the Russians and the Ukrainians about the price of gas that Russia is going to supply to Ukraine. And the Ukrainians insist on a low price. The Russians insist on a market price. The Russians eventually cut off the gas destined for Ukraine. And the Ukrainians 
retaliate by siphoning off Russian gas, which is passing through their pipelines destined for European customers. And that causes a gas shortage across Central and East, Eastern Europe um, during the winter in 2006. Then in 2009, the same thing happens all over again. So at that point, the Russians say to themselves, this is enough's enough. We're going to build pipelines that are going to circumvent Ukraine because we can't rely on the Ukrainians to be proper, reliable partners in gas transit. So they build first Nord Stream 1, which is a direct a pipeline going directly from Russia to Germany. Then firstly, then they then they build, they start building a pipeline to, called South Stream, which was originally going to go to Bulgaria. But when that pipeline ran into problems with the European Union, they renegotiated it and it's now going to Turkey. And that's Turk Stream, and that's been completed this year. And then in 2015, they negotiated with the Germans a second pipeline to Germany, which is Nord Stream 2. And that ran into all kinds of obstacles. And eventually, those obstacles were overcome. And that's also going to be completed this year. Now, that's, that's the, the gas, that's the pipeline issues. The geopolitics of this was that, of course, the US wanted to gain control of Ukraine for all kinds of reasons, one of which undoubtedly was that it wanted to control or rather to be in a position to contain Russian gas exports to Europe. So Ukraine was the original transit state. And that was one reason why the US was so interested because they wanted to be able to be astride the transit state through whom Russian gas went to Europe. And that was an important part of the background to the coup that took place in Ukraine in February 2014, which, as we know, the United States supported. And let's not and let's not forget, Alexander, the previous yeah, revolution. The previous revolution in 2004, yeah. the, the Orange Revolution. You're absolutely right. I mean, these, the, the, the 2014 revolution was the second attempt at this sort of thing. But anyway, that, that was the policy. Um, now, what then happened was, as I said, the, the Russians were building these pipelines. Um, the Russians and the Ukrainians again weren't agreeing on the price. The Ukrainians said, well, we're not going to buy any price, any gas at all from Russia. We're going to import it ourselves from Europe. And the US leaned on its European allies. And there was this bizarre arrangement that was then set up, which was supposedly going to be a reverse flow. So Russian gas arrives in Europe from all kinds of sources. It's then sent back up the pipelines from Europe into Ukraine. It's, in other words, reverse flow. Now, as the Russians have repeatedly pointed out, that is absolutely technologically impossible. If you have Russian gas flowing down a pipeline, you can't have European gas flowing simultaneously up the same pipeline. It doesn't happen. That can't happen. And besides, the way pipelines are built, is that they are no, you know, one-way streets, if you like. The gas can only flow in one direction. The compressors, the turbines, all the machinery is intended to send the gas from east to west, not from west to east. What was really happening, what was actually happening, is that the Ukrainians were being allowed by the Europeans to siphon off some of the Russian gas that was still passing through that uh, pipeline and hold it on to themselves and um, pay the Europeans for that gas with money that the Europeans were giving to them. It was a bizarre and very complicated arrangement, but it, it kept Ukraine going economically. It was very important 
to helping Ukraine, you know, keep going. What happened now is Turk Stream is almost done. Nord Stream 2 is almost done. The Russians are far less dependent on Ukraine than they used to be. The Europeans, for their part, are also less dependent on Ukraine for gas transit than they used to be because they're able to get their gas now from the south via Turkey and from the north via Germany. They don't need Ukraine so much anymore. Emmanuel Macron, who is becoming, you know, the most important person, or at least so he thinks, in the European Union, says we're not going to expand the European Union anymore until it's reformed. He won't let Albania join, he won't let North Macedonia join, and he certainly won't let Ukraine join. So Ukraine is no longer needed either for gas or for EU expansion. So what has happened over the last couple of days is that the Europeans have informed the Ukrainians that reverse flow must end and the Ukrainians must negotiate with the Russians to buy gas from the Russians again. So Ukraine is back where it started, but from a, in a much weaker position. It is no longer the key transit state it was 10 years ago or, 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 or 15 years ago. So it's no, it's going to lose that position fairly soon. And at the same time, it is once again being thrown back onto outright dependence on Russia for its natural gas. This is a major development and it's been barely reported at all. So Ukraine has to now negotiate with Russia. There yes. is no way around it. Is that correct? There is no way around it. Now, there are, there are negotiations, by the way, which have been ongoing between the Russians and the Ukrainians. The Russians have made one thing absolutely clear, that if the Ukrainians want gas from Russia, they must accept, they must accept that uh, um, all these legal claims that the Ukrainians have been trying to bring against Gazprom in various, that's the Russian natural gas monopoly exporter in various courts, both in Ukraine and Europe, they must all be dropped. And that's gonna be difficult for the Ukrainians, for the Ukrainian government to do, it'd be very humiliating for them. But that's one thing that the Russians say. And of course, there will be the usual tough negotiations on the price, but with the Russians holding the whip hand. The Russians say, that it will be cheaper for Ukraine to buy gas directly from them than it would be to buy gas via this reverse stream arrangement from Europe. But the reality was that the price of the gas Ukraine, Ukraine was getting from, Russia, from, from Europe or from, from reverse stream was higher they were being subsidized to do it by the Europeans. So even though the nominal price of the Russian gas will be lower, the Ukrainians could actually find that they're paying money for their gas, which they weren't paying before. So it's a, it's a radical change and it signals that Europe is finally ditching this whole Ukrainian enterprise. All right, so Europe is cutting them loose. Yes. Trump, um is not so keen on Obama's Ukraine project as well. That's also absolutely. The European... Can I say something? Yes, about absolutely. That? I mean, that is one of the, the, the only interesting thing for me about these Ukraine gate proceedings is that it has highlighted what Donald Trump thinks of Ukraine. We now know what he thinks about Ukraine. And the answer is that he thinks it's corrupt, that he thinks it interfered in the 2016 election, that he doesn't like it at all. This has been an issue for some of these people who have been hounding him on Russiagate. So Donald Trump doesn't like Ukraine, and the U U U Europeans are becoming fed up with Ukraine and are no longer prepared to help it any longer. The Ukrainians are running out of friends in the West. Well, that was Poroshenko's doing. I mean, to be fair, yeah, Zelensky, absolutely. I think... And we're going to give Zelensky a chance and we hope that he succeeds. Yeah, I, hope, I hope that he yeah. comes through. Yeah. But Poroshenko put all his money, bet mm. all the chips on Hillary Clinton. That's just a fact. Absolutely. He did. He went no full question. on board for Hillary. Absolutely. He did. No question and he lost. That. And he lost. And he lost badly. And he destroyed uh, 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 Ukraine's reputation with exactly. Donald Trump. I mean, that was one of the 
consequences of what he did. Massive political, geopolitical blunder on Poroshenko's Absolutely. part. Massive. Absolutely. Absolutely. But then I always said he wasn't too bright, so yeah. perhaps not so surprising. Yeah, he shouldn't have gotten involved. He no. should have stayed out of it, but no. he thought no. that he's going to make nice with Hillary Clinton and everything was going to be rosy for him. Exactly. And let's not forget that Ukraine was the number one donor to the Clinton Foundation as well. We which should is never now, forget that. Which is now losing money, by the way. Yeah, which is now losing <laughs> so money. There, exactly. So there exactly. Go. So to wrap it up, Alexander, so the EU sees all of this going on. They also see these uh, mm. names of Hunter Biden and, yeah. you know, Carries and Hines and Devin Archers and yeah. Pelosi's and all these people, you know, being brought into the light, say, for mm. their activities in Ukraine. Mm. And I'm sure the Europeans are doing much of the same stuff. No, oh, that all of these guys in the U.S. are doing, and they say, "You know what? We need to cut loose of this whole thing." Indeed, sir. We need to get um, out. So, what happens now with well, Ukraine? I mean, what well, happens with the EU? What happens with all of this? Just to go to the Europeans who are also involved. I mean, let's not forget that one of the people on the Burisma board is Kniazniewski, who was the former president of Poland. I mean, he was there along with Hunter Biden or sitting on this board of Burisma Holdings. I mean, it's really quite, you know suggestive so yes they're all going to cut it off and um i think there will always be some sort of attempt to sort of massage this thing but there was a very very interesting interview that was given to the u.s media by uh kolomoisky or kolomoisky who is one of the big named oligarchs in the west in, in in ukraine sorry and he said he said well the west is cutting us off which it is and um in light of this our interests now are to realign with Russia because we have no choice. That's what we're going to do. We may not want to do it, but what, what option do we have? So I think what we're going to see over the next couple of years, it'll, it won't happen suddenly, but we will gradually see more and more distancing of the major Western powers from Ukraine. The Germans are utterly fed up with this thing. The whole policy of engagement with Ukraine was very much Angela Merkel's policy. And she's looking increasingly as if she's in her last days and is very discredited in Germany anyway. Macron is made very clear that he has no interest in the whole enterprise and is hostile to it. So the, the chances are that we will gradually see the whole thing beginning to turn and we will see Ukraine starting to shift back into what many people would think is its natural alignment, which is with Russia. Um, Kolomoisky spoke absurdly about a revival of the Warsaw Pact, which is absurd. But at least I think we will probably see Ukraine gradually shifting ground uh, and reintegrating with, with Russia again. There will be many problems along the way. There will be furious resistance from some people within Ukraine itself, particularly in Western Ukraine, particularly these uh, ultra right wing and neo Nazi elements that are there in Ukraine. But I think the logic now is irreversible. And let's not forget that it's Kolomoisky who's rumored to be behind the real man behind Burisma. And indeed, indeed so. so. Indeed so. So he's got he's got a personal interest in all of this. But then so do all the Ukrainian oligarchs at the end of the day. I mean, they, they are all about money and about themselves. What they will be looking to do is to cut a deal with Putin because he is the only game in show. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, Russia played the long game and it worked. As it always does. Mm -hmm. yeah, as it always you know, does. Everything, everything comes to him who waits. All right. Alexander McCurris, Editor-in-Chief of the Durant. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below and click on the notifications bell to make sure you get notifications every time we publish a new video. Check us out on iTunes and on SoundCloud to get an audio copy of this video as well. And please donate to us on PayPal, Patreon, and subscribe. Star, your donation really helps out this channel a whole lot. And check us out on BitChute and on Duran Video. Duran Video is our own platform in beta mode. BitChute is the free speech platform, and we are on both of those sites as well, publishing videos that we do every day. And also check us out on Telegram, where we publish everything that we do. It all goes on Telegram, so subscribe to us on the Telegram app. And Alexander, of course, we have the Duran Shop, which is our main driving vehicle to keep this channel moving. <laughs>
Indeed, and I've got to be very careful because I've still got some tea here, and it's not full anymore, but I've got to be a bit careful not to splash it around. Before I do talk about our mugs and our other great merchandise, can I just re reinforce what Alex said about our platforms, our new platforms? We are very excited about them. We are really amazed both by their technical quality and by the way in which they liberate us in so many ways to be able to speak our minds even more clearly and to say even more forthrightly the sort of things we want to say. And we believe that we will extend our reach through these platforms in every respect and make what we think is already a great product that we're providing you in our research and our analysis and our commentary is going to make it even better. So please look us up on these platforms and please support us there because if you, if you value our service, I think you will help us a lot by going there. But you will also help us by going to our shop and buying these absolutely phenomenal things, which we, by the way, uh, on the Duran ourselves are not just very proud of, but enjoy greatly because they are frankly great. Look at this magnificent, beautiful mug. Look how easily I'm holding it, how balanced it is. Uh, a, a light but extremely strong porcelain body. It keeps the tea in it, which in this case, by the way, is Queen Anne tea, perfectly warm for long periods of time as I drink it. And uh, it keeps things like beer refreshed. I, I'm told, by the way, somebody suggested to me that I should drink champagne from it. I'll give it a try. Why not? It's good enough for champagne, I think. So let's let's uh, let's uh, 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 experiment with the great things that you can drink from these magic mugs from. And this one, as I said, has the uh, has the emblem of the Russian Federation on it, as you find on the on Mad Vladimir Putin's mugs, only I'm pretty sure our mugs are much better than his mugs. I mean, that's my own personal guess, because you can't really improve on these. And uh, by the way, for what it's worth, the Russians make a pretty good imitation champagne. So one can try that out also. But we don't just make really phenomenal mugs. We make amazing shirts like the ones that Alex and I are wearing at this moment. This is a long sleeved shirt because unlike Alex, who's in Athens, which is, I hope, rather warm. London in November is cold and wet and windy and miserable. But this is a perfect shirt for being warm in that kind of day. And as you see, it's long sleeved. It's 100% cotton. It's got the Duran double headed eagle. You can see it there. And of course, we've got lots of other shirts. We've got short sleeve t shirts. We've got a truly amazing, very smart, very elegant polo shirts, which, as some of our viewers know, I've worn to really special events and have made a big impression, a really good impression, favorable impression wearing wearing to them to those events. We've also got V-neck shirts. We've got hoodies, very necessary in cold weather too. We've got hats. We've got stickers. We've got great things. So help the Duran, help yourself, go to our shop, own these great things. Alex will tell you how. The Duranshop.com. You will find a link in the description box down below. Alexander Mercurius, thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.